And the next talk is going to be by Gina Brown. I don't need to introduce her because quite recently, uh, just uh, now, uh, Dr. Karachun introduced uh, uh, Professor Gina Brown. So she's a well known uh, expert. So the talk name is What is the role of uh, so um, I'd like to thank the organizers and uh, the Petrov Institute for, for organizing um, the, the meeting and for inviting me um, to a, a beautiful city, a beautiful uh, St. Petersburg, which I had the opportunity to see even in the poor weather yesterday, but it was a very um, amazing sight. Thank you very much. So um, the, the idea, um, as you may have appreciated, is that we try to get as much information before surgery as possible to avoid too many surprises for the surgeon, but also to enable the patient to get the right um, strategy for, for treatment. Um, we all know that there are patients who are going to be at risk of local recurrence, and if you identify them beforehand, then you will hopefully eliminate that risk. And in the past, before MRI was being used, we saw that tumor was present at the circumferential margin in about uh, 30 to 40 percent of patients. And when that happened, then those patients did not survive and they had a less than 40 percent survival. Of course, things have improved since then. We um, can see the mesorectal fascia, we can see um, the relationship of tumor to that plane. And we also know that if you see what, more than one millimeter of space between the tumor and the fascia, that there will be a very low risk of margin involvement and therefore a low risk of local recurrence. So when we looked at the outcome data for these patients uh, and we published this in JCO, not only did the circumferential resection margin status on MRI predict for risk of local recurrence, it also predicted very strongly the risk of disease-free survival and overall survival. So um, it doesn't matter if the pathology agrees or does not agree. If MRI shows tumor within a millimeter, that's a bad prognostic feature. And those patients really should have as much treatment preoperatively and also radical surgery afterwards. So. Um, we showed that, in fact, using the T stage, the Duke staging system was not very helpful in stratifying patients between good and poor prognosis. In fact, using CRM staging was, was the most important thing, but there are obviously other factors as well that we look into. But this was a fundamental part of staging rectal cancer. So wh what we also showed is that you cannot guess which patients are going to be straightforward or not straightforward. So really the policy should be that you operate on patients after discussion of the MRI in a multidisciplinary meeting. In our situation back in 1999, MRI was beginning to be used in some of our institutions and not every patient received a high resolution MRI and not every patient had a preoperative discussion with the whole multidisciplinary team. And what we found was with the same group of surgeons, the same technical ability, if that patient missed the opportunity for a discussion in their meeting, those patients had a very high rate of margin positivity because what the surgeon judged to be straightforward was not always so. And, th and that is why you have to discuss every patient in our meetings. And, and when, we did, when we looked at this and then re-audited, the positive CRM rate fell to 3%. And now it's even much lower than that because we now have a policy where if the CRM is looking involved, those patients have a, a beyond TME approach, i.e. an exenterative approach for surgery. So, so that is why we, uh, in the UK, every patient with rectal cancer has an MRI and every patient has the MRI discussed by the surgeons, oncologists, radiologists and pathologists all together every week. Um, and that enables that patient to have a definitive approach for their treatment. Um, and that what it means is that if the tumor is more than a millimeter away from the mesorectal plane, then the risk of local recurrence is four times less. And, but if it's involving the plane, then you have this ongoing increased risk, which you really want to prevent uh, in the future. 
So this is why in patients who have tumor extending to the mesorectal margin, and I think hopefully if I show you on the pointer, this is the typical appearance of an MRI rectal cancer. You see the raised rolled edges of the tumor, and then anteriorly is the invading portion of the tumor, and there you can see the tumor is involving the mesorectal margin. So if that patient did not have an MRI and went for TME approach surgery, then the margin would have been involved anteriorly, and they would have had a local recurrence, and probably metastatic disease as well. So what happens is this patient gets preoperative treatment, and that tumor is now gone, and instead of uh, tumor being present at the mesorectal margin, it's just fibrosis, and in fact, the tumor has completely gone from the specimen. So in this patient, um, the preoperative treatment resulted in going from a positive CRM to a negative CRM and a, a clear CRM at, in the pathology and the patient's risk of local recurrence was eliminated. Um, and so, so that means that MRI is not just prognostic, it's predictive. So if you identify something, you treat it, you cause the regression, then that means that the original risk factor no longer becomes a risk factor. And what we have shown is that maybe half of the patients go from positive to negative through preoperative treatment. But then there is a remaining half that stay positive. So what do you do about that? Do you still operate as you plan to, do a TME approach, or do you extend the surgery in order to prevent the positive CRM? In which case you have to look at the patient after the preoperative chemoradiotherapy and reassess the margins. Is it fibrosis present, like here, in which case it is safe to do a TME approach? Or is it that there is still tumor present, and in which case you need to extend the surgery? So that, that's really where we have moved to now. Uh, and in the international consensus meeting, which uh, Paris and myself, uh, Professor Tekis and myself um, uh, conducted, we invited um, uh, many experts to contribute to this uh, consensus document and amongst the conclusions was that we should consciously identify patients who require surgery beyond TME. So in our radiology reports, if it says the CRM is involved, then you don't just go ahead and do the operation. You think about referring to a center who has the expertise to do um, a beyond TME approach. And I think you'll hear from Paris what that in operation really involves and how much um, uh, you have to do and how much involvement with other disciplines you have in order to make these operations happen. So it's not straightforward, but it, it's essential if we want to improve survival in patients with rectal cancer. So when we um, look at these tumours, we, we not just look at the central mesorectal compartment, we think about the different other compartments which will need to be resected on block in order to deliver a clear margin. So if the tumor is involving the mesorectal fascia posteriorly, you cannot do a TME operation. You have to remove the posterior compartment. And that means sometimes a partial sacrectomy. And if the tumor is involving the prostate anteriorly, you cannot do a TME approach. You have to do a beyond TME approach, which involves an on block resection of the prostate and, and the bladder as well. So this is why um, preoperative assessment of these tumors after treatment is so important. Um, and when, what um, I think Svetlana has, um, has shared with um, the radiologists in, in Russia is the concept of a pro forma report. So not only do you stage the tumor, but you also document what is going on in the different compartments if the tumor is involving the mesorectal margin. Uh, and that means that you can then give just not the T stage, N stage, EMVI status, but also which compartments where the compartments are involved and what the resection would require in order to get a clear margin so that everyone is clear what is needed for that patient. Um, and that's really important if the patient is to go in the right pathway for care and for treatment. So in this particular case, there was a very aggressive tumor which previously had involved the prostate. Um, and you can see that there is no safe place for the TME surgeon to go without resulting in losing the plane and perforating the rectum. It is not possible to do a TME operation in this patient. Um, there will be no plane. So if you identify something like this, then the sensible thing is to stay outside of the plane and to remove the entire uh, 
um, pelvic um, organ, so you have to remove the prostate on block in order to deliver a tumour-free radial margin. This can only be determined by looking at the post-treatment scan. You cannot feel this feature. Um, and the digital rectal examination does not give you the anatomical detail that you need to plan curative surgery. So this is why these patients need this kind of high-resolution MRI scan. And, and on the high resolution, you can tell the difference between residual tumour or residual fibrosis. This is residual fibrosis, but it, it, it is so dense and so um, extensive that you have to stay outside of it in order to um, deliver an, a proper operation. And so this is the post-operative. This is after uh, Professor Tekis operated and he um, undertook a flap reconstruction. The prostate has been removed. But you can see that this patient will never get a pelvic recurrence. There is no risk of tumour recurrence within the pelvis. So that's the idea of the tumour MRI. I think you saw some beautiful anatomy from Professor Kuzu. And the way that we try to relate anatomy in, in cadavers to MRI in the patient is, it should be the same. We should understand the same anatomical structures, the mesorectal fascia, the presacral fascia, uh, and the pelvic compartments. It's, it's all very important to appreciate the anatomy on the imaging and to understand it fully. Uh, and as surgeons, it is cru crucial that you feel comfortable looking at MRI scans and understanding what you're seeing compared with what you might see in the dissection. So we can see all the structures, including Denonvillier's fascia, and we can also see um, the, the vascular anatomy, including normal variants, such as the persistence of the middle rectal artery and vein going laterally into the sidewall compartment. So these are the sort of things that we would um, see on a preoperative MRI scan. Um, and of course, the mesorectal fascia, which is this low signal intensity layer that surrounds the mesorectum. And the mesorectum itself is very different from normal pelvic fat. You can see that there is a lot of material here. There are lymphatics, there are veins, there are lymph nodes, there is connective tissue, there is um, perineural tissue, there is a lot of material here, which is very different to pelvic fat, which is rather featureless and has nothing in it, just fat. So, so that's how you can tell the difference between the mesorectal compartment and the rest of the pelvis. But you need the high resolution scans to appreciate all of this anatomy. So in assessing low rectal cancer, um, what previously happened was these patients would have a, a, a general APE, the TME plane would be performed, and that would result in the muscle tube being the dissection plane in the lower portion of the rectum. And that would be fine for a mid-rectal tumor, but in a low rectal tumor, if you have um, evidence of a T2 tumor even, then, then that would be on the surface of the specimen. So it came as no surprise that for patients with tumors that are around four or five centimeters from the anal verge, that there was a high rate of margin positivity because if you had a full thickness T2 tumor, then that would be on the edge of the specimen, i.e. Uh, margin involvement, and then a high risk of pelvic recurrence. So we used an MRI staging system which looked at the rectal wall, the intersphincteric plane, and the levator and the external sphincter musculature. And if tumor was extending into this space between the rectal wall and the external sphincter complex, the levator, the puborectalis sling, the external sphincter, then it meant that the TME plane was not going to be safe surgically. It means that the tumor would be um, threatened by the surgical dissection. So when you see a tumor that extends into this space, then the better and safer thing to do is to operate outside this plane. And so this is the approach. You think of the operation in two planes either the intersphincteric plane, where there is no tumor threatening the space between the rectal wall and the external sphincter complex, or the extra levator plane, where there is um, a safer space for the surgeon to stay outside the levator and the external sphincter complex and avoid perforating the tumor. So, so that's um, what we advocated. We, we came up with this staging system. So in other words, if you have a tumor that's a T3 or T4 higher up, you still reassess what the tumor is doing around the level of the sphincter. So it may be that there is no tumor at the level of the sphincter or that the tumor is confined to the rectal wall. 
If that is the case, then you can say that the TME plane is safe, and therefore it is possible to do either an intersphincteric coloanal anastomosis or an intersphincteric APE. But if that plane is not safe, if the tumor is extending and involving the intersphincteric plane, then that patient needs an extra levator abdominoperineal excision. And, and we believe, and, and Professor Tekis encourages us, to ensure that we do specify exactly what plane is at risk and what sort of operation will be needed in order to deliver a clear margin. So that's really very important. Um, th this just essentially shows that if you use the system of, of staging these tumors, there's an 18-fold increased risk of margin positivity if the tumor extends beyond the mesorectal fascia. Um, th this is a very busy slide, but essentially what, what we showed was that by using this staging system, we could reduce the margin positivity rates from 30% to 9%. This is not a complete elimination of margin involvement in low rectal cancer, but what we noticed also was that tumors that were extending to the anterior plane sometimes would need more extensive surgery than was being offered just by an extra levator APE. So, so there, there is more to be done for these low rectal tumors. But certainly, if a patient has safe TME plane, um, you don't need to give more radiotherapy to those patients because all that happens is you make the operation subsequently more difficult because you get fibrosis in areas where there previously wasn't fibrosis and you end up with instances where um, the, the quality of the specimen is not as good as if you did a primary operation. So, so over-treating low rectal cancers is not a good idea. So if you stage them precisely, the T1 and T2 tumors and tumors that are not threatening the intersphincteric plane at the level of the uh, puborectalis sling or just above can be spared preoperative radiotherapy and can have surgery safely without, without that treatment. Um, but if you stage it using this low rectal system, we have this five-fold difference in margin positivity rates between safe versus unsafe uh, tumors. So um, that was what uh, we published the data. If you want to review the data in detail, it's published in the Annals of Surgery um, last year. Um, and this was a multi-center study. This was multiple different radiologists looking at these scans. It wasn't just a single expert. Uh, and that's important because it's, we, what we believe is that this met method can be taught to others if, if they're willing to look at the scans in a, in a better way and to undertake the scans in a better way. So um, how do we find the tumors that are poor prognosis? Um, because in fact, the current systems that people describe aren't really good enough to separate out the good and poor prognosis tumors. So the Duke system doesn't really work. What we prefer to think about is, is these, uh, these other aspects. Now, Duke's developed the staging system for lymph nodes and showed that Duke C tumors had only a 7% survival uh, um, likelihood. So 93% of patients were, were dead within three years if you had lymph nodes in the specimen in rectal cancer. Now, now that no longer is true in TME surgery. These patients, when they have their mesorectum removed and the lymph nodes removed, for, the, for most patients, if the CRM is negative, that patient has been cured. But um, what what Dukes also noted, and what other pathologists noted, was that there was a prognostic importance of depth of spread. And it's something that has not been particularly understood or recognized as important, yet the data is overwhelming that if you measure the depth of spread from the rectal wall beyond, that that gives you much more precise um, uh, prognostic information than just calling something T3. So a T3 tumor with less than a millimeter spread has the same outlook as a T2 tumor, and that's not surprising. And that's been known about in every pathology series that measures the depth and looks at outcomes. If tumor spread is between one and five millimeters, that's also good prognosis. Um, but when the tumor starts to spread beyond five millimeters, you start to see a worse prognostic outcome. The patient's survival starts to fall, and the rate of distant metastatic disease also increases. And as far as imaging goes, extramural depth of spread is actually more important 
than nodal status in terms of separating out good and poor prognosis patients. So when we measure the depth of spread from the muscularis propria to the external edge of the tumor in millimeters precisely, what we get is a very precise correlation with the same measurement done by a pathologist. If you have that much precision and it's a prognostic predictor, then we should use something that is precise rather than something that is imprecise to determine treatment strategies. So lymph node assessment is imprecise for radiology, always, but depth of spread measurement is very precise and gives a much more accurate prognostic stratification. In other words, we separate out the patients who are going to survive versus those patients who do not do so well. So do we care that this is a T3 or a T2 tumor? Clearly not. If there's a millimeter of spread and we call it, then that's fine. But the, the reality is this patient has a very minimal tumor extension through the rectal wall, and therefore the outlook for that patient is extremely good. The prognosis is identical. And what we, what we know from the pathology literature and the pathology data is that if a tumor has less than five millimeters spread, regardless of nodal status, that these patients will have a very good survival outcome. So in the Mercury study, we showed with multiple radiologists, so 30 radiologists um, who are underwent um, training um, and under, also um, did the scans using the high resolution technique, we showed that, that these patients could avoid radiotherapy if the CRM was clear and that if there was no evidence of uh, vascular invasion on the MRI and, and CRM was clear, then these patients could avoid chemo, chemo radiotherapy or radiotherapy preoperatively and also postoperative radiotherapy was avoided in these patients. That was their policy. And what we showed was that in these patients who had this good prognosis feature, which amounted to or almost um, a third of the patients, that they did not have any particular risk of local recurrence uh, and that their survival was also extremely good with 85 to 95% disease-free survival. So, so these patients um, can be identified preoperatively and, and preoperative therapy avoided. So it means that it doesn't really matter if your nodal status is involved or not, if you have less than five millimeters spread. Furthermore, the risk of there being lymph node involvement is very small anyway, it's only 15%. So for, for these patients, a policy by using this definition of avoiding preoperative therapy will avoid excess morbidity and will not put those patients at particular risk of local recurrence. And that probably is about a third of the patients that we see with rectal cancer. So the, the, the dangers of treating patients, every, all patients with radiotherapy is, is well known. Uh, and that's why we do discourage the policy of over-treating these patients because of the damage that, that occurs to them. So what is the risk of local recurrence if you are node positive versus node negative? If the CRM is clear on MRI, then the chances of, um, a, positive, of a pelvic recurrence of the good quality TME is only about 5%. And there's no difference between node negative and node, negative patient, node positive and node negative patients in terms of the risk of local recurrence. Uh, and that's been shown even in randomized trials. So um, I think the, in the United States and in North America, they are investigating the possibility of avoiding radiotherapy in patients who have T3 tumors that have less than five millimeters spread uh, and will ignore the lymph node status as part of that policy. And, and hopefully they will show that it is, it is a safe way to avoid preoperative radiotherapy. So, so the, 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 the real point is that these patients, when you identify CRM involvement, you identify a risk factor for local recurrence. But the Duke staging, uh, stage two, stage three, there isn't any particular risk factor for local recurrence. It is not a, a, a way of stratifying these patients. But vascular invasion is something that MRI is very, very good at seeing and, and is more accurate than pathology in identification. And what we have Le, le, sort of learned to understand from looking at the outcomes of these patients, it is more prevalent than nodal metastatic disease, and it actually has a better predictor for the risk of metastatic disease than nodal status. So what we have understood from looking at these patients is that tumor does not spread to tumor node liver, 
it goes from tumor to vein to liver. Uh, and that is the pathway of spread. And that makes sense. It's, what we, it's what's been known about for a long time. But I think it's been, again, it's been rather neglected because, unfortunately, when pathologists identify a nodule, they may not be too critical about the nature of that nodule. Is it in a vein or is it in a lymph node? They just call it a nodule. And very often they will call it a lymph node when really it was never a lymph node to begin with. So it's very important from the radiology perspective that we do not fall into the same trap. We must look very carefully at the nodules that we see and if they are within a vein, then we must call it a vascular deposit. We should not call it a lymph node. And by doing that, we can stratify the patients much more accurately in terms of what their real risk is of distant metastatic disease, rather than worrying too much about lymph nodes, which enlarge as part of a normal good immune response to having a tumor, and which the patient is actually using to fight the cancer. So I, I think this is really Im an important concept and something that needs to change globally for the TNM classification. Because when we do the multivariate analysis and we publish this in Annals of Surgery, vascular invasion is found twice as often by the MR radiologist than by the pathologist. You, they only found 46 patients, we found 99, and the risk of metastatic disease is twice as much as nodal status or anything else that you find. Um, and when the pathologist does find it, they do get this hazard ratio of twice as much, but they're only finding half the number of patients that we are finding. Uh, and these are patients who have been tr um, treated with preoperative chemoradiotherapy and have been identified as having vascular invasion at the end of their treatment. So it means that if you have a patient who goes from positive to negative, they do well, but if they remain positive, that is an ongoing risk of metastatic disease. And that's important for surveillance of the patient if you want to look for that risk of ongoing development of metastatic disease in the liver. So th this is why this is such an important prognostic factor, and we, this is where it was published. So uh, most pathologists, I think, are not very discriminatory about whether this, to call this a lymph node or vascular invasion. It is a nodule. It is a nodule. It is surrounded by fat. So if a pathologist is audited on how many nodules, how many lymph nodes they retrieve, they would prefer to call this a lymph node than to call it a vascular deposit. But on imaging, we can appreciate that this is a vascular deposit because veins have a signal void. They show up as black holes and you can follow them anatomically. So you can see on the next slice that there is another portion of vein and another portion of vein. So we can tell that this has gone into a vein, it has destroyed and expanded the vein, and it has formed this nodule. There is, a, there is blood, there is blood here. It is a vascular deposit. Uh, and so it is wrong to call it a lymph node. Um, it is incorrect. What we should call it is a vascular deposit. It's extra nodal disease. And when the pathologists in the 1930s looked at this question, they found that nearly every patient with metastatic disease on autopsy had vascular invasion in their primary cancer. And it was unusual to see a case of metastatic disease without vascular invasion. They noticed this, you know, almost 100 years ago, yet we are ignoring this in our TNM classification. So, so they, they, very, they concluded that direct extension, bloodstream spread, is probably the most important part of disease spread in these patients. Um, and, and certainly that was um, the importance understood back then, and then subsequently by Tolbert at St. Mark's in 1981. But it is vascular invasion, it's not lymphovascular invasion, you actually have to look at the veins. Um, and I think some of the uh, analyses done subsequently m mix the two together, uh, and that's also incorrect. So, so the pathologist um, in, in the 1930s was very specific about how they would look for a vein, they would look for venous anatomy, uh, but I think that skill is maybe somewhat neglected um, by modern pathologists. So, do we think this is a vascular deposit or a lymph node? So again, 
maybe the pathologist will struggle to know which this is because there's no lymphatic material, there's no lymph node architecture. So they would just call this a lymph node a, replaced by a tumor. But in fact, on the MRI, we can see the vein and we can see the tumor has grown and destroyed that vein. There is the vein on the other side. These are the, the normal features of, of normal veins, uh, and we see them as parallel channels. And when you see a deposit growing along the course of a vein, you must call this uh, a vascular deposit. Uh, and this is another example. Here it's, it's a bit easier to see because the vein has not been completely destroyed, but you can see the, the vascular anatomy and then irregular expansion of that vessel, uh, which is not normal. It is a phenomenon of vascular spread. So um, the problem we find when we've audited pathologists, and this is work done in, in Canada, showing huge underreporting by pathologists. Uh, but they can be trained to, to do a bit better and to look, for example, at the lone arterial sign. So if you see an artery in the specimen and there is no vein next to it but a nodule of tumor next to an artery, then pathologists should be encouraged to think about the possibility that this is not a lymph node, that this is vascular invasion. So these are very simple things that pathologists can think about. But for, for the radiologists, our ability to see vascular invasion is very straightforward. We see tubular expansion of tumor along the course of vessels. So we look for this feature, uh, and when we look for it, we'll see it in about 40% of patients with rectal cancer. And, and what this means is that unlike lymph nodes, which stay confined within the mesorectum, vascular spread does not respect the mesorectal envelope. Vascular spread extends beyond the mesorectal envelope and can extend into the pelvic sidewall compartment. And so when you see tumor like this, and it, it looks as if it's ending at the mesorectal fascia, you can be sure that there are ways that that tumor can spread laterally into the um, pelvic sidewall compartment. And so um, what doesn't come as a surprise is the fact that when people look for vascular invasion, and pathologists did in the ACCORD trial, it was centrally reviewed pathology by Anne Rullier, she found that vascular invasion was an independent risk factor for CRM involvement. And that is not a surprise, that if you see tumor like this growing in a vein, you shouldn't be surprised that maybe somewhere else the CRM is involved because of the ability for tumour to seed along the vessels. So it's a risk factor not just for distant metastatic spread, it will be a risk factor for pelvic recurrence because of the associated link with CRM involvement. And indeed we showed exactly the same phenomenon of vascular invasion being a, an independent risk factor for margin involvement on pathology in the Mercury 2 low rectal cancer trial. So um, what, we sh what we can see is that of all the prognostic factors that we can measure on imaging, uh, apart from the depth of spread and CRM, vascular invasion is a really important one because it independently um, uh, is a risk factor for poor disease-free survival. So that in three years after operating, if a patient has vascular invasion, only 30% of these patients have um, the absence of metastatic disease. That 30% of these patients will have some sort of metastatic disease in the first three years after being operated on for vascular invasion. Um, it means that what we need to think about is intensifying treatment preoperatively, reversing EMVI status, but also offering closer surveillance of those patients so that we can identify metastatic disease earlier on and, and treat those radically with um, metastatectomy. So what we also showed is that if you reverse the EMVI status, if they go from positive to negative, and we did so in almost half the patients, then they, you substantially reduce their risk of distant metastatic disease. It becomes almost the same as a patient who was EMVI negative to begin with. Uh, and so what that means is it's also it's worth treating these patients with chemoradiotherapy because in half you will reverse their status uh, and their, their risk of metastatic disease is substantially reduced. So, so, so this is why we, we think pelvic radiotherapy is important as well as chemotherapy and downstaging the tumor, reversing their EMVI positive status through chemoradiotherapy is, is really important prognostically. Um, and what we've also found is that the vascular invasion... 
um, is a risk factor for um, the de development of pelvic sidewall nodal disease. Um, so uh, what we have noticed is that these patients uh, make up about 12% of patients with rectal cancer, and if you look for this feature, it is an independent, well, it's not independent, but it is a risk factor for poor survival. And again, it's associated with vascular invasion. So, so that's um, the sort of thing. Now, uh, you know, I've often heard, well, you know, do we need to really stage every single patient? What about these early rectal cancers? They, they don't need staging by MRI, really. They're, they're very straightforward to do. That was an early rectal cancer, but look what happened to this patient. And we see it quite frequently. This is discontinuous vascular invasion. This tumour has gone into a vessel laterally. And when you look at this image on the coronal plane, uh, if I'll just show you again, there is the vein with, with tumour spread and the pelvic sidewall deposit associated with it. So, so this is a, quite a common phenomenon with, with rectal cancer, discontinuous vascular invasion. It finds its way into a vein and then it causes all sorts of damage. So in fact, this patient did not need a local excision for their T1 cancer, they needed an exenteration. They needed um, lateral pelvic sidewall dissection in order to remove the tumour that had spread beyond the TME compartment and had extended into the pelvic sidewall. But actually, they needed preoperative chemo radiotherapy first. So, so this is um, the sort of thing. And you know, here's another example: is a very early tumour. The rectal wall is completely intact. Um, good um, thickness of muscularis preserved. Perfect for an intersphincteric TME until you see the vascular invasion here. So this is tumour deposit in a vein, there's the signal void of the vein, there's the tumour, and it's right up against the TME plane. So this patient would need an extra levator APE in order to clear the margin, which would be involved by tumour in a vein. So this is why preoperative staging is so crucial and looking for vascular invasion is so important. So uh, I think maybe I should summarise. Uh, have we got any more time? Uh, Alexi, shall I carry on? Yeah. You tell me when to stop because, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so uh, I think what we have to understand is that patients who have low, or, uh, have low risk features, i.e. they have uh, T3B or less, where TME plane is safe and there's absence of EMVI, you can offer these patients primary surgery because you will reduce the colostomy rate you will reduce the dysfunction from radiotherapy and you will not benefit the patient from protective radiotherapy. It doesn't protect anything. So, so these patients can do very well without preoperative therapy and they'll make up a third of the patients that we see. But on the other hand, we should look out for the poor prognostic features and we should treat those more aggressively. So you can now understand that if you populate a trial a clinical trial, an international randomized phase three trial with 50% of patients with stage two, stage three, and they're all like this, that, that, pa that trial is effectively un underpowered because they would never get a local recurrence. Those patients all have good survival and you wouldn't be surprised that those trials are negative to show an improvement in survival. So that, that is why at the moment we're not making much advance in preoperative strategies because if you overtreat a huge portion of those uh, patients, you will get a negative trial. So uh, that is a real problem with the poor TNM staging system that we have today. So um, what, what we suggest is, is a bit more careful stratification. So for example, you can do um, a prognostic assessment based on mucinous tumours. So MRI will pick up mucinous tumours much more readily than the initial biopsy. Uh, and in a publication that uh, we uh, published in uh, European Journal of Cancer, we showed a five-fold increase uh, likelihood of getting the diagnosis right for a mucinous tumour using MRI versus the initial biopsy because the biopsy does not sample the area of mucin within the, the tumour. So, so this is why just looking for things like this uh, in a patient who was considered to have a tubular villus adenoma because on the luminal side that's all you can see but in fact the surgeon did not appreciate what was going on at the base of the tubular villus adenoma, that there was a horrible mucinous tumour underneath it all. And the biopsies came back as dysplasia only. 
So you can see how you cannot necessarily judge whether something is straightforward, easy, or benign until you do the MRI scan. So our recommendation is any polyp, whether it's malignant or benign, should have an MRI assessment to assess the safety of the initial procedure, which could be a local excision, but just to find out exactly if it is as benign as you think it is, because sometimes it will not be. So um, that's um, our own experience is we've been looking at patients who've undergone chemoradiotherapy, uh, and we have shown that these patients um, who downstage to less than T2 have a better survival than those patients who remain beyond the muscularis propria after treatment. Um, and we looked at the factors maybe that you could see on baseline imaging that could predict for a good versus poor response to treatment. Uh, and what we showed was that it wasn't related to the age or the sex of the patient or even the size of the tumor. These were not risk factors for whether or not the tumor would re regress. What we found was a risk factor was that um, vascular invasion was a sign that these patients would not downstage as well as the patients who are EMVI negative. But the use of chemotherapy with these patients who had chemoradiotherapy, and this could be either before or after the chemoradiotherapy, was associated with a much greater rate of EMVI regression from positive to negative. So if you want to start thinking about intensifying preoperative therapy in these patients that are high risk and show an improvement in survival, then you need to enrich a trial with EMVI positive patients, give them the chemoradiotherapy, half of them will regress and become EMVI negative and they will do well, but there will be a half that remain with involvement and if you give those patients further chemotherapy to improve their EMVI status, it is likely, and that's what we want to test in a clinical trial, that these patients will have a better overall survival um, in terms of metastatic disease compared with those patients who go straight to surgery with their positive EMVI. So that, that's, that's the sort of approach that we would be thinking of in, in these high-risk patients. So what we, what we showed is that even after treatment, our ability to assess um, T stage with, MR, with against pathology was, was pretty good, it wasn't perfect, but our ability to uh, uh, determine outcomes was more or less the same. Uh, and that is, it really comes as no surprise because, uh, you know, it, neither is perfect. Um, uh, completely downstage tumours do not have 100% survival, but they do have a better survival than those patients who remain persistently uh, with tumour spread through the wall. Um, but what is a better um, assessment of tumour response is the tumour regression grade, where we look at how much fibrosis there is at the end of treatment compared with how much residual tumour there is. And, and when we look in, into that, we find that the patients who have residual tumour signal predominating as, as a, at the end of their treatment have a fourfold worse survival and a threefold worse disease-free survival. Um, but CRM status remains the important prognostic factor for local recurrence. So, so this is another thing that we look at on the post-treatment scan. We look at vascular invasion, but we also look at how much the tumour has regressed. And when we look at that, you can see the separation in the survival curves of, based on MRTRG. And it is not something that the pathologists have been able to produce, this kind of three-way separation. So you have a group of patients with MRTRG1 and 2, which is predominant fibrosis, a group of patients with MRTRG3, which is fibrosis is predominating, but there's lots of macroscopic residual tumour left, and then TRG4 and 5, which is predominant tumour and not very much fibrosis, and there's a substantial survival difference between those, those three groups of patients. Um, not just disease-free survival, but also overall survival. And what we've also shown is that this is something that's very easy for radiologists to learn how to do. Um, we've shown it in the Mercury study, in the Expert C trial, in the GEMCAD study, in the CORE study. It goes, we have kappa agreements of approximately 0.8 in, in the radiologists. But what's very much more important is that 40% of patients that we see after chemoradiotherapy fall into this category and they have a 90% overall survival compared with only 9% of patients with PATH-CR, 
So we're seeing many more patients with a good response than the pathologists are picking up using their definition of good response, which is pathological complete response. So we think that TRG is a better endpoint because it not only identifies more patients that have benefited, but also predicts the survival better than path CR uh, as an endpoint. So that, that's, um, that's something that we um, advocate. So technique is very important. Um, this is a low resolution image. I think you can't really appreciate what's going on here. What is this? Is it a lymph node? What is, what is going on? Would you even make, take any notice of this? But when you do the high resolution image, it looks completely different. You can see that uh, there is clearly a deposit and it's tracking along a vessel. This is a discontinuous vascular invasion. The next place for this tumor to go is the liver. And of course, preoperative radiotherapy, uh, shrinking this will improve the outcome for this patient. So, so what is the difference between this scan and this scan? The difference is five minutes of time. <laughs> That's all. There's nothing technologically magic about it. It's just five extra minutes. Uh, and it's something that can be easily done in any machine in Russia in, on the planet, because most of the MRI machines that are currently working are more than capable of getting images like this. It's just having someone dedicated to learn how to do it and, and to spend five extra minutes on a scan. That's, that's all it requires. It's nothing magical at all. Um, so what, what it enables is that we can get more precise with this high resolution imaging. We can use TRG, we can look at regression, we can look at as, as a way of predicting outcomes at the end of treatment. And, and that's something that we're going to be testing. So Dukes does not perform very well. This is the mercury data using Dukes staging system. The, the B's and the C's overlap. It's, it's a pointless, it's a pointless staging system, really pointless. Um, this is our staging strategy, T3 based on depth of spread. So if you have a T3 A or B, no EMVI, good survival. If you have T3 C and D with the MVI, very poor survival. And, and there's a very clean um, strat stratification. If you put all of these patients in a clinical trial, that clinical trial will be negative. If you put these patients in a trial intensifying therapy, that trial will be positive for a survival benefit. It's as simple as that. Um, you don't need fancy biomarkers, you just need to stage the patients a little bit more carefully than using stage one, two, and three. So um, this is what we recommend. CRM involvement, because that's a risk for local recurrence. Depth of spread, you should measure the depth in millimeters beyond the muscularis. Vascular invasion on EMVI, on, on MRI. It's a risk factor that we see more frequently than pathologists manage, but it's a risk factor for distant and local recurrence. Mucinous tumors, we can identify those on MRI. Tumor regression grading, and a, as a way of identifying those patients who may well end up um, having a, almost a complete response and the same kind of outcomes as complete responders. So in, in the future, we will be doing this kind of, that, well, we, we're actually running this trial now. It's open. We've enrolled 10 patients already. It's been open six weeks in our hospital. And in this, uh, treat, in this strategy, in the control arm, an MRI will be done um, to stage the patients. After treatment, they will have um, assessment of the CRM, but they will then have surgery and then chemotherapy adjuvantly. So these are high-risk tumors. We'll be enriching these as T3, C, D, and EMVI positive patients, as well as CRM patients. So these are the patients that will be randomized. But in the interventional arm, we will use the tumor regression grade as a strategy to further determine what else to do for the patient. So we think about 30 to 40% will have a good TRG response, and we will offer these patients deferral of surgery, so avoidance of surgery altogether. But in the patients who have not had a great response, TRG 3, 4, or 5, they will be offered further chemotherapy, consolidation chemotherapy, a repeat scan, and then surgery. Some of those patients with TRG 3 may well become suitable for deferral of surgery after the consolidation chemotherapy. And the idea is to show an improvement in survival by the use of chemotherapy and the EMVI persistent positive patients, the CRM positive patients, and to compare that against the control arm where this will not be offered until after they've had their surgery. Uh, this is what currently most people practice globally. Maybe they don't even do the MRI scan after treatment, but this is the current standard of care, and we're hoping that this becomes 
the new standard of care uh, when this phase three trial is complete. Uh, we're open globally. We have centers from all over the world joining us. And if, if you're willing to have your radiologist trained to do the MRI as high resolution and to offer this kind of treatment, then, uh, then this, this trial is open for, for your centers. We, we advocate the pro forma reporting system. This is, this is our baseline assessment. And this is what we spend time looking at in our multidisciplinary team meetings. We go through these reports line by line and looking at those images as well. Um, and after treatment, we also do a similar uh, assessment. Uh, and we show that each one of these factors is prognostic and predictive. In other words, a change in those statuses will affect the patient outcome. So it, it is accurate in terms of predicting what will happen to the patient. So um, th there's a whole team, including Paris, who I work with very closely, who's been involved in, in all our recent research, uh, but also all our fellows, including Svetlana, who has been really um, important in, in hopefully helping to bring some of this um, back to Russia. And, and she's, I think, available to help you know, make you understand a bit more what, what is possible with, with MRI. So, so thank you very much. I'm sorry I, I spent too long. <laughs> thank you. Uh, esteemed colleagues, are there any questions from the audience? So this, uh, it was so comprehensive, so no knowledge, it looks to be like a guidelines for us, uh, like a way to act. Uh, so show us main uh, areas what should pay attention to, not only to radiologists, but to chemotherapists and to surgeons. Then essentially uh, it's clear why we have no questions, because so much material was probably, but there is one question from Alexei. Uh, Gina, first of all, thanks a lot for this uh, really bright presentation, as usual. But I would like to ask you two questions. So first question is about this classification you use. This T1A, B, C, D, it's quite clear classification, but we as surgeons are worried not about the depth and invasion, but the distance from the uh, tumor margin to mesorectal fascia. Why, do, why don't you use this classification? This. In fact, it was, I showed it very rapidly on one of our slides, but on one of the very first slides I showed that if the distance is one millimeter or less, that's a prognostic factor for local recurrence. But after one millimeter, so if it's two, three, four, five millimeters, it stops being a prognostic factor. So it is not the distance to the margin, it is the distance beyond the, mesorect beyond the muscularis propria that becomes prognostic as long as it's more than one millimeter. Thank you. One more question. Uh, uh, maybe it's not just a question, but could you tell me please, the preciseness uh, of MRI staging is so good that it's really competitive to morphology. So does it seem to you that we're coming to the, to the times when we'll use MRI for staging and morphologists will just give us some molecular description of the tumor to make better chemotherapy? I think that's a really important point. I, I think by the time the morphology comes through, your opportunities have been lost. If you wait for the pathology to tell you what you should have done, it's too late. So, so I think absolutely the, the key point is get as much information from the preoperative imaging, get the strategy right. The surgery becomes the last step in the process for a reason, because what you do surgically is it. You can't change it afterwards. You can't put the rectum back in. You can't do anything. So, so that is why it is so important to get the staging precise. The molecular pathology at initial biopsy is proving to be very disappointing. You can see the reasons why. So for example, if you have a, a, a dysplastic tumor on the luminal side, but mucin on the invasive border, which is far from the reach of the biopsy probe, you are not going to get a representative sample of what, how biologically aggressive that tumor is. But you can get that from the imaging. So if you see vascular invasion, but the biopsy shows, you know, no poor prognostic features. You don't go for the biopsy, you go for the imaging. This is a poor prognosis tumor, regardless of what the MMR status or MSH status is. So you must treat accordingly. Afterwards, we, we may be able to learn a little bit more from those, for example, from the trigger trial, from those resistant tumors. So where there has been a poor response, we can look at the material 
to see what is the mechanism for through chemo radio res resistance. But we think that number of patients will be maybe less than 20%. So for three quarters of the patients we treat, the strategy that we have on offer may well be sufficient without the need for the molecular diagnostics, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, if possible, one more question. I'd like to uh, ask you such a practical question. So it's clear uh, that uh, with those tumors, which are T3A, T3B, and plus, and CRM minus, in those tumors, you showed uh, really good results, but those results are coming from those clinics where, where they have very high level of uh, surgeons, per se. Uh, in particular, could you recommend an approach, surgical, pure surgical approach, not the combined approach, in, in cases when you see tumors of the, say, mid ampular uh, section with no dips in vision to, to CNB and plus and CRM minus? Could you recommend such approach for uh, social general care physicians, or you would prefer in such cases first to start radiotherapy? and then to the surgery? That's a, really, that's a really important question. So in a sense, what you're asking is for in situations where the surgery may not be guaranteed to be good quality, can a policy of just giving chemo radiotherapy to those patients be as good a measure as primary surgery? So, so the answer to that is all the data we have from the clinical trials is that... that Radiotherapy and chemoradiotherapy does not compensate for poor quality surgery. That if you leave the mesorectum behind with disease, the radiotherapy won't make up for that deficiency. So you, what you will see is unexpectedly high pelvic recurrence rates, unexpectedly high positive CRM rates. We saw that in the Polish randomized trial, unfortunately. We saw that they were reporting 30% positive margin rates, I believe or even higher, and 30% recurrence, pelvic recurrence rates. That is too high to think that their policy was appropriate. Um, therefore, what we have to take measures, and they're very simple measures, to ensure that the quality of surgery meets the standards that patients deserve. So that means photographing the specimens, auditing the quality, maybe having a public registry of surgical quality, and ensuring that surgeons can access the training, like these kind of important workshops, so that they can deliver those kind of specimens. We had the same problem in the UK. Um, we had this point where colorectal surgeons had to specialize. And, and when those first meetings happened and, and breast surgeons were coming to the colorectal meeting and were doing one colorectal cancer case a year, they very quickly disappeared from the meetings because they realized that their material was being looked at, was being scrutinized. The photographs were being, why was this margin positive? The MRI predicted negative margin. Why was it positive? The questions were being asked and they stopped practicing. And I think that's the only way. You have to be transparent, you have to show your results, and you have to be comfortable to show the results. Thank you very much.